Hi everyone, this is Sharan here. Welcome to my channel. Today in this video, we are going to see about some of the common interview questions. And what we are going to see is what is the objective as a recruiter behind asking these questions? What is expected from the recruiter's point of view? What should be the response? So what I'm going to do is this will be a small series where I'm going to select some of the common data science interview questions and I'm going to explain you what is the objective behind those questions from the recruiter point of view and what is expected from you during the interview. So let's get started. Let's go through some of these questions one by one and let's understand what should be the response during an interview if someone has asked you this particular question. The first question is what is data handling? What are all the various steps that is involved in data handling? This is a very common question because 80% of your time as a data scientist in any 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 job would be spent on data handling in analyzing the data in solving the various issues that is present in the data so as a data scientist it is important for you to understand what this process is and what are all the various steps that is involved and what are all the various techniques that can help you in each of those steps so from the recruiter point of view the reason behind this question is to understand how much breadth and depth of knowledge you have on the data handling concept so what is data handling? You can maybe start with the definition of data handling. So data handling is a process of transforming the data from one form to another form to make sure that you are able, the data is able to meet the expectations of the downstream application, right? Whatever data science problem that you are going to solve towards the end of it, you are going to ensure that this data handling process ensures that the data is transformed and good enough for you to use for the prediction problem or for the data analysis, whatever it might be. So this data handling process is helping you to transform data from one format to another format. Now coming to the question, so what are all the different steps that is involved in data handling? So the first step is understanding the data. You need to, you need to, you need to answer, answer like what are all the different techniques that can be used for understanding the data like what is an univariate, bivariate and multivariate analysis. What are all the various charts that can help in order to better understand the data. So focus on the various techniques and various visualizations, various methods that can be used to understand the data to the best extent. The second one is formatting issue. So there typically there would be a lot of formatting issues like the dates would be in different formats. When you are working on a data science problem, the data comes from different areas like uh, they won't be consistent. So the, the dates could be in different formats uh, or the data as such like the categorical data. Let's say if you have a categorical data, when those categorical data comes from different systems, it might not, it might, might not be consistent across the system. So it is, it is important for you to format it, translate it, make sure that it is consistent across, across the data that we are going to use for the model building. So that's, that, that's the second step. After understanding the data, the second one is fixing the format issues and make sure that your data is in consistent format. The next one is cleaning the data. So when you work, you know, when you work on any, any data set, there will be a lot of issues, right? There will be a lot of noise. There will be a lot of missing data. It is good to know about various techniques that can be used in order to solve those problem. If you have a missing data, let's say, uh, let's say the temperature is missing for a particular day. So if the temperature is missing for a particular day, so maybe in this particular scenario, it is good enough to take the proxy of the closest available data and then use it as a proxy for the, for the record where the temperature is actually missing. Whereas let's say for a particular, for a particular day, the number of sales for a particular product is missing. So maybe we can't use the same methodology because sales on a weekday and weekend it will be much different. Sales on a uh, public holiday and non-public holiday could be very different. So sales on a particular day when there was a huge discount, whereas a day when there was no discount would be very different. And hence, we can't use the data that is closely available to this missing data. So depending upon what type of data it is, so the missing values needs to be handled differently. When asked about this particular question, you need to you need to ensure that you are able to provide some references. Like uh, there are various various techniques that can be used, various methods that can be used to identify and solve or fix the missing data problem or the noise data. The next one is improving the data set. In some cases, we might have to transform the data. For example, there could be some data points which would be uh, which would be a continuous value. 
but it would make a lot of sense if we are able to group them into different categories and then analyze them further. So it is important for us to use various techniques to improve the data set as such. In some cases, we might have to introduce a lot of third party data. For example, let's say we have temperature data set, but we want to have some additional information like whether there was a rainfall on the particular day or not. It will be good to use an external data set and then see how that external data set is helping in improving our solution. And finally, validating, validating your data set. So once you have the data set transformed, cleaned, all the issues fixed, the last step is to validate whether the data set that you have will be good enough to be consumed by the algorithm that you are thinking to implement or uh, the data set will be good enough for the analysis that you are planning to do. So these are all the five steps. So next time when you are being asked about the data handling, start with the definition. So data handling is a process which helps you to transform the data from one form to another form to ensure that the data is good enough to be used by the downstream application, whether prediction or analysis. And the various steps would be the first one is understanding the data. The second one is formatting and make sure that data is in consistent format. The third one is make sure the data is clean enough, all the missing values, everything is fits, the different techniques that can be used for fixing it. The fourth one is uh, improving the data set, like transforming some weight, some features and maybe introduction of uh, the third party data to ensure that the overall information that is present in the data set has improved. And finally, validate that whatever data set is that you are having is good enough for the solution that you are planning to implement. So this is it about the data handling. So next time in an interview, if you can explain all these steps in detail, that will be really good. The second question is how to handle missing data. So when an interviewer is asking you a question about how to handle missing data, what they are trying to understand is they are trying to understand if you have experienced this prob problem in the past and what, what, what was your methodology or your, uh, your way of approach in towards solving this, these missing data problem. So your first approach should be to understand whether there is any pattern in these missing data. If a data set is missing, what we try to do is we try to understand if it is missing for certain category of users or certain category of data set. After that, what we need to understand is we need to understand how much data is missing. If it is just a few records that is missing, then it will be fine to ignore those records and then proceed with the rest of the data set. But if there is a large number of data set is missing, and if we feel that particular feature is really important, we need to focus and we need to fix all those missing data issues. And then what you do is you move on to the next step, like what are all the different ways to fix the missing data issue. The first one is deleting the record. If there is only few records that is actually having some missing data issues, then it is okay for us to ignore those records, to delete those records. The other approach is uh, picking up the closest observation next to the missing data. For example, as I explained for the previous question, like a data set such as temperature, rainfall, these data sets which might not change drastically between one day to another day. So then in these cases, it is enough, like it will be good enough for us to pick the closest available data set. Whereas it might not be the case for other data set. For example, if we are looking into sales of a particular product, the sales of the particular product as I explained like in the previous question could be could be impacted or could depend on various other factors like whether it is holiday, non-holiday, public holiday, whether there was a lot of discounts, whether there was a combine before before that particular day. And hence, uh, and, and hence in those cases, it is it, uh, it will be good for us to understand what is the data set that is missing. We, we need to use various filter conditions and if we want to replace the missing data with the closest to proxy, we need to understand, we need to group them into different categories and uh, we need to take the mean for the each uh, for the individual categories and within the categories if there is any data set that is missing we can think about using the mean of the of that particular category or of that particular subset but we can't we can't just go with the overall mean or we can't just pick up the closest available data and replace it it might not work in all the scenarios the other techniques for uh, handling the missing data would be like uh, maybe coming up with a prediction predictive algorithm for missing data as such. We have a lot of other parameters and hence what we can do is we can try to use a predictive algorithm and predict what could be the missing data. And again, each of these options has both the pros as well as cons. So it exactly like it depends upon the scenario, what type of problem that we are trying to solve. And based on that particular problem, we need to pick up 
a, on a, an option that is most suitable so when you when an interviewer asks you this question like how do you handle the missing data as i explained you need to first it start with uh, with analysis of that missing data right whether there is any patterns and the next one is going a little bit deeper to understand how much data is actually missing whether there is a large, large number of data or small number of data and then get into the various options that is available to handle the missing data like right? deletion of the record or picking up the closest observation or coming up with various analysis and uh, coming up with various subsets and uh, use the the mean within the subsets to replace the missing values or coming up with a predictive algorithm like uh, all together in order to predict all those missing values so these are all the various options in order to fix the dead missing data issue and finally maybe what you can also add is you can add from the algorithm point of view why it is important to fix the missing data issues algorithms such as k and n ignore the missing records ignore the features that has a lot of missing records and hence uh, and hence it is not actually it is not actually contributing to improve the accuracy of the model whereas algorithms such as naybase what's fine even if there is few data points that is missing and hence for example if you are deciding to go with tnn so then it is important for you to fix all those missing data uh, issues before implementing the algorithm the next question is what is an supervised learning what is an unsupervised learning these are all the very basic concepts and hence it is important for you to explain it to the best extent so what is an supervised learning so what you can say is supervised learning as the name suggest we are able to supervise the algorithm so how do we supervise the algorithm by sub by supplying and data which is labeled so in terms of supervised learning what we are trying to do is we are trying to build an predictive algorithm and train the algorithm on a data set which is labeled where we know the independent variable and the dependent variable the patterns between them so the algorithm is trained on and labeled a data set and the model that has been trained is used to make the prediction on the data set where we do not know the outcome we do not know the dependent variable so that is the supervised learning we are able to supervise the algorithm by supplying a small data set where we know both input as well as the output where we know the exact patterns some of the examples of supervised learning are uh, like linear regression svm random forest so in all these cases what we try to do is we try to pass on and uh, data data where we know the input as well as the output we train the model and the trained model is used in order to make the prediction in those cases where we don't know the uh, output so that is the supervised learning unsupervised learning on the other hand will be used in scenarios where we don't know the relationship between the input and output where we can't come up with uh, we can't provide the algorithm with all those uh, uh, all those data points so what the algorithm will do is in unsupervised learning the algorithm will try to extract the various patterns for example let's say we have the profile information of various customers and we want to cluster them into different group we as such don't know what is the actual uh, how to group them into different clusters so what the algorithm will do is if we pass on the various input for example like uh, the age the, the area where they reside in how much uh, uh, how much money they spend on a particular platform how much money they earn like what is the size of their family how far do they live away from the city what is the uh, mode of transportation that they use commonly let's say these are all the various data points so what we try to do is we try to use all these data points and cluster them into different group it will be easy for us to cluster based on one category for example uh, we can we can cluster the customers depending upon the mode in which they travel like primarily but what what here we are trying to achieve is we are trying to use multiple features and we are going to combine them together and use all of them in order to divide in order to create different clusters of customers and hence and hence uh, it is important for us to use some kind of a clustering algorithm like for example uh, it okay, means plus train some of the other other uh, uh, problems are market based analysis so depending upon depending upon what kind of products we buy coming up with a market based analysis to identify what are all the various products that are generally bought together so this is this will be typically used by various retailers uh, like uh, not only is the supermarkets but even in online sales so when there are certain products which are bought together what we can do is we can try to like in an in a physical store we can try to keep all those products together so that like uh, 
there is some kind of a cross sell that is happening so same thing goes in online sales as well so these are all the various examples for an unsupervised learning so next time when someone is asking you what is supervised learning and what is unsupervised learning come up with the definition like what is supervised learning what are all the various algorithms under supervised learning so why it is called as supervised learning and similarly in unsupervised learning like uh, come up with a definition what it is and explain provide examples like uh, various exam various problems where an unsupervised learning can be used to solve the particular problem the next question is what is a decision tree and usually the recruiter would also come up with Uh, come up with a question like uh, is it good to have let's say like maybe 100 small trees or one large tree so this is a commonly asked question in data science interview so the objective behind it is to understand whether you know what an decision tree is and you you understand the concepts behind the decision tree because if you know about the concepts behind a decision tree you will be able to you will be able to answer whether it is good to have 100 small trees or one large tree So now uh, when someone is asking you what is a decision tree so what you need to do is you need to start with the basics so a decision tree algorithm is part of a supervised learning so a decision tree can be used for both a classification as well as regression problem so many might be thinking like a re- uh, decision tree will be only used for a classification problem but that, that's not the case decision tree can also be used for regression problem to predict a continuous value a target value which is continuous uh, which is which is a continuous number So what is a definition of a decision tree? So a decision tree is an example that like is an algorithm where we try to come up with a training model that can predict a target class or target value because we can solve both classification as well as regression problem. So we come up with a model which can predict the target class or the target value by using simple rules that are generated based on the training data set that we provide. So what the algorithm tries to do is depending upon the data that we provide to it it will try to come up with a small decisions like a small rules that can be used to build a decision tree which can be used in order to make the final prediction So then maybe what you can explain is you can explain some of the concepts behind decision tree like what is an root node what is an leaf node what is parent and child node what is an decision node you can also explain about uh, Uh, let's say a particular uh, decision tree so what you can do is you can come up with an uh, decision tree algorithm for example let's say you pick the id3 algorithm so id3 algorithm is uh, is a typical example for a decision tree so it helps to build a decision tree using the entropy and information drain so what you can tell is after explaining what is decision tree you can pick up the uh, id3 and then you can explain that it is an algorithm that is that helps to build a decision tree using entropy and information drain where entropy is the measure of randomness of a particular attribute so when you are trying to build a decision tree using id3 algorithm what we need to do is we need to select the attribute that has lower randomness lower entropy and a higher information drain so information drain is how much the attribute is able to help you in order to improve the prediction like it might be classification it, it might be predicting the different classes or predicting the value that is close to the target so that's the concept behind the uh, decision tree using the id3 algorithm so this is an iterative process so we pick up one attribute at a time so first we start with the root attribute which has lowest entropy highest information drain then we go for the next attribute that has the lowest entropy and the highest information drain and this process is repeated until we reach the entropy of 0 so when the entropy of 0 when the entropy is equal to 0 it means that we have reached the bottom of the tree like we have reached the leaf node so you can explain about these algorithms so next time when someone is asking you what is a decision tree you start with the basics you, you tell them that decision tree is part of the supervised learning algorithm so it can be used for both the classification and regression so it is used to uh, to train a model Uh, based on the rules that is present in the actual data set and then what you will what you do is you come up with an algorithm you pick an algorithm such as id3 and explain how the uh, how uh, the algorithm is used to build a decision tree so in terms of id3 it uses the two main concepts the entropy and information drain in order to build the decision tree and coming to the second part of the questions whether it is good to have a 50 or 100 small trees or one large tree so the answer for that is uh, when you have one large tree what happens is the model is, uh, uh, is 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 trained too much or it will be an overfit for the training data set 
so when you throw a new data set for the towards the like when you throw a new data set on the particular model the model most likely would fail terribly so what needs to be done is when we have 50 different trees or 100 different trees even if the trees are not complete like shorter what happens is that the when we take the average performance of all those trees and then if we come up with a prediction that will be much better that will be much better because uh, because it avoids the overfit and hence uh, when you ask this particular question always remember that having a large number of trees is always better than having one large tree the next question is what are all the various metrics that can be used to measure the accuracy of the model so here the objective of the interviewer is to understand whether you are aware of the different metrics that can be used to measure the performance of the algorithm like different types of algorithm there are techniques to measure the accuracy for a regression algorithm as well as for the classification algorithm so first for a regression algorithm some of the techniques are mean square absolute error which will which will exactly uh, help help you to identify how well you are able to predict how close your prediction is to the actual values and then the other measures are r square and adjusted r square all these are the measures that helps you to understand how good your model is performing so uh, when asked about this question you tell them that uh, for regression the uh, three measures that can be used to measure the accuracy are mean square absolute error r square and ad adjusted r square so coming to the classification problem so classification problem needs to be handled in a different way some of the uh, techniques that can be some of the metrics that can be used to measure the performance of uh, uh, of a classification model are uh, roc area under curve precision and uh, recall and uh, the overall accuracy like uh, how in how much percentage of cases you are able to uh, predict the results accurately and log loss so these are all the various methods that can be used in order to measure the accuracy or performance of a model in case of a classification problem. That is it for now. If you like what I am doing here, please give a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. If you think this might be helpful to any of your friends, please share it with them as well. And see you in the next session. Bye until then.